welcome everybody. So, uh, talk with a pro, Creative Partnerships. Why this seminar? This is going to be based on something I started as part of the USBG, the United States Bartenders Guild of New York, of which I'm the vice president. And I started this interview series because um, I was always very interested in there's so many creative and talented people in our industry, and I was wondering, like, how did you get there? What have you been doing, and what, why am I not doing that? And uh, so it's been a really, really great series that all of our members have been really excited about. So I wanted to bring that to a larger forum. Uh, and why these two bars? Well, because, uh, well, we've got the Dead Rabbit, of course, and Artesian, uh, two very, very highly regarded bars, world-renowned, and bars that are often referred to as the best. And also what I found interesting is that behind the driving forces behind these two bars are two sets of partners. Um, we, Sean Muldoon, Jack McGarry from Dead Rabbit, and Alex Cretena and Simona Caporale. Unfortunately, Simona couldn't be here today. He had obligations back in London. So Alex is actually going to answer all the questions, half in Italian accent and half in Czech. Is that OK with you? All right, good. Um, great. So we're going to have time for your questions <laughs> later on. So don't worry about that. And there's no PowerPoint for this because all the information that you are going to get today is going to come from those three. So, um, so there's that. All right, so let's get started. Um, so again, just quickly about, I'm not going to give you a big introduction to these gentlemen because you can uh, Google them, look on the website. But Artesian Bar Langham, this year it's nominated for Best Bar Team, Best International Hotel Bar, and it's also the world's best bar. He's number one. 2012 and 2013, and in 2011 it won World's Best Cocktail Menu at Tails. Dead Rabbit, um, this year nominated for Best American Cocktail Bar, Best Spirit Selection. In 2013 it won International Bartender of the Year for Jack, uh, best, cocktail, you know, best Cocktail Menu, Best New Bar, and it's on the world's top 50 bars at number five. And just quickly, full disclosure, I work at the Dead Rabbit, so, <laughs> and, but, and, and, uh, and I've been to the Artesian 2.25 times. So last time was this March. Uh, so let's start, and I would love for you to start giving a brief description of the bar and how you got to be there, Alex. Ciao, sexy people. <laughs> this is the Italian accent. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very excited to be here. Uh, Artesian is, uh, is a bar or a lounge uh, which situated at the Langham Hotel in London. Uh, Langham London has been there since 1865, which makes it the oldest grand hotel in Europe. I haven't joined the company since then. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful bar designed by David Collins. It's a classic uh, hotel grand room, high ceilings. We have natural light, so that's, 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 what, that's what makes it really beautiful. And, and we love cocktails, and we love to look uh, after our guests. Great, OK. And what about uh, you gentlemen? Hi. <laughs> it's the first time I've spoken to this. I'm just testing my voice. Um, it's sexy, don't worry. It's sexy. <laughs> so Dead Rabbit is a, it's a bi-level bar. There's two different uh, styles of rooms going on in the same premises. One is an Irish whiskey bar, um, biggest Irish whiskey collection in the USA. We've 130 bottles. Um, most of those have been flown in from Ireland. You cannot get them in this country, and we give those away. We don't actually sell them. I'm just making that clear. Um, we specialize in that room, pints of Guinness, um, Irish coffees. We believe fully that we serve the best Irish coffee probably in the world, and I'm not ashamed to say that. Come and, come and test us out if you don't believe me. Um, <laughs> upstairs is the cocktail bar, which is a much more uh, a sit-down experience. We have ragtime piano on Friday nights, Saturday nights, and it's, uh, it's the cocktail bar, the cocktail part of our, of our operation. All right, great. So let's get right actually into talking about your menus. Alex, let's hear about, so this is your former menu that you had. This up, is right? the old menu. Right, yeah. exactly, all right. Well, uh, this is the one that won the 2013? Uh, no, that's a different one, that's, that's one before. Oh, okay, sorry. Or two before Fancy. that. All right. Uh, well, uh, our menus uh, are, we all, the way how we understand them is uh, like a fashion house would understand a collection. So every year in autumn, uh, we decide on an overall theme. Uh, we spend like a month and a half of arguments, and then we actually decide on one. And, uh, and then we spend several months working on all the ideas, uh, and everything in that collection will be in one way or another affected with that. So if you think about brands like Hermes, who would say, you know, for one year, maybe a Rivers or 
Aztec and Mayan culture. And then every single piece in that collection has something to do with the rivers or, you know, or Aztec culture. So this particular one, uh, the, the theme was uh, perfume and scent. So there was a lot of perfume ingredients. The menu itself uh, was uh, designed to be like a color-coded perfume catalog. And uh, you know, all, uh, it was all about scent. Right, it's like a dial a menu. So yeah. every time you can turn it, the new the new recipes come up in that little box there. The um, reason we why we take sorry no please the reason why we take one year is because we have realized that one year is first of all kind of optional uh, for all the brands who support us to get enough out of it, uh, but also it gives us enough time uh, to promote the menu, come up with the next one. Uh, but also, most importantly, to give all our guests uh, the chance to come and actually taste them, because a lot of uh, lot of our guests in the hotel and people who come from outside are international travelers. Right. So, actually, did you say how often, how how far in advance you start planning for this, the research and development and tasting and all that stuff? We start in September and we release the menu on second of July. Okay. It's like we, we don't work on it all this time, right. but certain things like a signature service where it takes a lot of time to produce, design, then you receive the prototype, you realize you fucked it up, you need to start again. That's mm -hmm. why we take so long. I agree. And so, all right. And what about uh, Sean and Jack? What, do you, what about this menu? Tell us a little bit about it because it's, uh, it's quite epic. I'll talk about the, the concept, and Jack can probably talk about the drinks. Um, concept is there's eight different. Uh, there's eight different years. The, the whole thing's about uh, John Morris. He was the leader of the Dead Rabbits. We launched our menu on his birthday. His, uh, his birthday. I think it was his 183rd birthday. And that's when we opened. It was our, our anniversary as well. It was all deliberate. We did this. It was all strategy. Um, so there's eight different years of his life. It's from the age of when he's like 19 until he's 27. And each year has a different um, thing that was going on in his life. For example, when he first came to New York, he was fresh. So the whole drink sec, the drink category, eight, drink, eight drinks are fresh drinks. They've all got fresh ingredients. The next section is called Fairy, for example. It's when he gets his nickname Old Smoke. He gets his back burned in a fight. So all the drinks are spicy. And that's the sort of theme we went with this menu. Um, very, very heavy, focused on Irish whiskey. Um, I think out of 64 drinks, there's probably 38 that have Irish whiskey in them. Um, and then the very back, we have a story uh, that's all about Irish whiskey, the rise and fall of Irish whiskey in Oops. the USA and generally the world. But one thing I want to say about this menu is we do big menus like this, like Alex, once a year. Um, it's a lot of reading. Um, we don't expect every customer that comes to our bar to read these menus. Inside the menu, we have an insert menu, which is a seasonal menu. It's 12 drinks. It changes every three months. That's what most people order from. We do menus like this to create a talking point, to uh, get publicity, um, and to get people to buy the menus. And since we launched this menu in February 12th, we've probably sold about four or 500 menus at $50 a pop. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do this. Yeah. Jack will talk about the drinks though. Um, yeah. With the drinks similar to Alex, we like to tell a story with the drinks. So with the first menu, it was all uh, geared towards the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, um, telling the story of the kingdom of mixed drinks through the, uh, the, the three punch, um, because punch was really the, the, the standard bar, if you will. Uh, but with the second menu, it was all about Irish whiskey because me and Sean, when, when we were researching standing bars, was it? In Brooklyn, yeah. um, we went in in this bar that we'll not name, but it's a reputable cocktail bar. <laughs> um, we walked in to research this one thing. We quickly realized that that wasn't going to work for our concept. Um, but we started looking at the back bar, checking to see if all the light bulbs were on, all the type of stuff that we do in every bar. Um, and we quickly realized that they had a massive selection of Scotch, a massive selection of Woodbees, a massive selection of Amaros. But when it came to Irish whiskey, there was absolutely no Irish whiskey. So uh, Sean asked the guy, do, "Where's your Where's your Irish whiskey?" Um, and he goes, "We don't We don't have We don't have any." And he's like, "But you're a cocktail bar, yeah? And you, like, what if somebody asks you an for an Irish coffee? What do you do?" And he goes, uh, "We use bourbon." I was like, right. <laughs> this is, uh, Sean's hair started to curl at that point. Uh, so we both kind of turned to each other and went, "This is a bit of a problem." Um, and that's when, but this whole menu, we really wanted to showcase the versatility of the of the spirit and indeed the category. Um, so we, we, out of all the drinks, we use. A lot of the blended Irish whiskeys in the shaken type of format, and we use a lot of the stirred, uh, for the stirred drinks, we use pot still Irish whiskey, which is a very resurgent category. Um, so that was the story that we were trying to tell. And again, the, the stories add uh, texture to the overriding emotion in all these illustrations. So it was a very, com everything had to be coherent for us. So it was basically the idea for the, the second menu. Can you talk a bit about these illustrations? They're pretty violent, pretty graphic. Um, 
I'm one of these guys, I believe in telling the story how it was, not um, how, this is how it was. There's a particular scene, I don't know if you've got it there, Frankie, but there's a particular scene. Um, did, did, you have the, did you have the picture with the there's 50 guys against one guy type thing in the first picture? Uh, I don't think I have that one, sorry. Yeah. That one there. That oh, one. this one, okay. So this is a, in real life, this is a, the guy in the middle picture is Bill the Butcher. I don't know if any of you have seen Gangs of New York, but he, Bill the Butcher and John, the Mor John Morrissey. John Morrissey's not featured in uh, Gangs of New York at all, the film, and I don't understand how that was because he was responsible for the murder of Bill the Butcher in real life. Um, I don't understand how that happened in the film. But um, this is where they score up. This is the third fight they have, and uh, it's over in basically uh, Amos Street Docks. Mm -hmm. This is where this fight takes place. It takes place at 8 o'clock in the morning, and Morrissey says to Bill the Butcher, I'll fight you any place, any, any time for blah, blah, blah amount of money. It's meant to be a one-on-one -on -one fight. Morrissey turns up, and there's about 200 of Bill the Butcher's guys and they leave Morrissey for dead. And apparently, according to the story, his face was so bad that they thought he lost an eye. Um, his eye, and that's why that picture is exactly like that on the bottom, because it's totally accurate. That's exactly how it happened. Mm -hmm. And all we're trying to do is tell New York, people in New York, their history exactly as it was. Mm -hmm. And who designs your menus? <laughs> it's a company called Drinksology in Belfast. Yeah. Um, We've been dealing with these guys for seven years. We've got a very, very, very unique relationship with these guys. When me and Jack were part of the Merchant Town Belfast. They were our guys back then as well. They do everything from um, the T-shirts, the, the coasters on the bar, to the grocery bags, the posters that we have. They do absolutely every single part of our branding. Yeah. Alex, what about you? Who, design, who, who works on the designs of your menus? Do you do that yourselves? I design them initially, and then we need to hire a designer to redesign it so it is actually presentable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we work uh, with a company called uh, Incorporate, which is, again, it's a design agency, mm -hmm. and uh, the name of the main uh, guy is Wesley Pickering. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also responsible for a lot of POS and a lot of things you see all around the world for all the premium brands. Most of the packaging is done by them as well, yeah. so you definitely came across them. Yeah. And uh, the, design, the designer who we work with is a young and up-and-coming lady called Clementine Mitchell. Oh really? Okay. But obviously you spent a lot, of, a lot of time and thought goes into these menus. Th didn't Dead Rabbit menu win um, a design award for, not of Tails, but of, yeah. I think, like um, I think I might have won two design awards yeah. um, for the designers that did it. Exactly, yeah. 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 It's very much like a graphic novel. Did you bring the menu? But okay, sorry. It's okay. Men, so forgetful. So let's talk about, <laughs> move on to the cocktails. I want to start with uh, Sean and Jack. I've got a few cocktail pictures here. But tell us about, uh, well, I'm going to show some pictures. What, what is this? So this is a, a moustache cup that we use in the bar. Um, Let me interrupt. It's perfect timing. What are we drinking, by the way? Um, is this the counter punch? No, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is <coughs> one of our punches that we offer in the bar. So this is a... Uh, we have rum, um, you have cognac, you have a, a porter in there, or an Irish stout, with a uh, lemon sherbet, which is basically the, the base of the punch, lemon juice and bitters. Um, so it's just an aromatic punch. Uh, hopefully it's, hopefully you're all enjoying it. Yeah, and this is how it would be served, Yeah. right? So we, uh, when we originally were realizing the project, we came over with something that was very, very different to programmers. We wanted the beverage program to be very unique in New York. Um, we felt like there was a lot of speakeasy bars, a lot of tiki bars, a lot of ver like various other bars, but we wanted to do something that was completely different. Um, and to do that, we invested a lot of money into our service work. So I think all in for the original, mm. like start out with the glassware and stuff like that, was around about $20,000 for punch bowls, these cups, and the original uh, glassware order. So it's, we have like, 14 different types of glasses in, in the bar. And it was all historically accurate because when we were researching, I wanted everything to be as accurate as possible with just modern kind of uh, modern uh, bre breathing into it. So that's uh, that's basically what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. And so, how does it work with the creating of the cocktails? Do you? Uh <laughs> so for the for the how first menu, we uh, took it took two and a half years to, to put the program together. While Sean was uh, figuring out all the con the stuff conceptually, we, I was just blasting away on all the drinks. Um, so we would have been in our apartment, Sean would have been working during the day, I, and I was in the apartment all day making drinks for about 12 to 14 hours, and he would have came back, and then we would have, I wouldn't say talks, probably lots of arguments about drinks and like d different other bits and pieces, but uh, that's basically what we've done. But we had so much time to dedicate it to it. My room was filled with pictures, like m really, really honing in on every last detail. Um, and then the second, but the first menu was all me, um, but the second menu we tried to open it up to the rest of the, Rest of the staff um, to get to get a bit of to get some drinks in there, and now it's every, mo every month we'll be having 
um, mo like mostly sit downs going through new drinks and new ideas and stuff like that. So it's much more democratic now than it, than it was in the in the early days. Mm -hmm. And that initial menu, how many takes or how many tries did you do for each cocktail? Like, was that was it? Uh, did so you get it right away, or is it? Because the drinks were all from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century originally, um, a lot of these drinks kind of weren't modern. Um, so things like distillation improved, maturation improved, ingredients improved. Um, so when it came to actually replicating these drinks of of uh, yesteryear, they weren't they weren't very good. Um, so we had to work on them to get them to taste good. Um, and I would have thought that a drink would have been right after maybe like 20 efforts, and then Sean would have came back and said, "That's not right." That's but like so we had a couple of people. We had. A, one of our uh, one of our one of the core guys as well would have came in uh, Ben. He would have tried drinks and it just it was a real collaboration, uh, but it was very frustrating because some of the drinks took up to about seventy efforts to get right. Um, so seven zero. Seven zero. So it was. Uh, it's yeah. a lot of juice down it's the a drain. Lot of, a lot of drinks. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, that sounds good. Um, and so, what about you, sir? Because uh, actually, you know what? I want to go back to Sean and Jack for one second. Do you have a philosophy as far as you know drinks? Because I think your style has changed, right? As yeah. far as because initially it was 17, 18, 19th century, like you said, and now the menu's a little bit more. Yeah, but we were talking the other day that when it comes to creating drinks, I I, I kind of think about the three Fs. Um, it's the function, so what you're trying to achieve. Um, so with the me our first menu, the function was the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The second menu, the function was Irish whiskey. Um, after that, you're talking about flavor. Um, so that's really starting to source what type of flavor you want to integrate into your function. And then finally, it's focus. So getting, achieving the, because the focus and the, uh, sorry, the flavor and the function are mutually beneficial. So it's just making that idea come to life. Um, so that's basically what we do. And yeah, I think I yeah. that answer. Yeah. yeah but the, yeah, so the original, it's the same thing with Alex. The theme for the first menu was the 17th, 18th, 19th century and the second, was uh was was Irish whiskey, so we're much more creative when it comes to new flavor pairings and stuff like that. Like right now, we have a drink coming on the menu with pistachio and fresh curry leaves, and that's something that we I, I would never have done for the first menu because it just didn't make it wasn't sense it didn't make sense historically. Yeah, and, yeah, and then we use things like we're using coconut rum and stuff like it's just a lot of stuff that I would never have originally touched is now starting to creep its way into the menu. And you, do you feel like the clientele is moving along with you? Was there any kind of pushback, anything like that? Well, I think when you're in New York, um, we had we made our reputation based on what we were doing with our first menu. Um, everybody was talking about it, but I hate I hate when things are stagnant. I like change. Um, I like things to grow. Um, so when we had the opportunity to change the new menu, everything we wanted everything to change. We wanted a new focus, a new theme. We wanted to keep everybody on their toes, and it's also great for your consumers mm -hmm. because there's something fresh to the table. If you're doing the same thing day in day out, and you're not prepared to change. I don't like. It's just not. It's not our style. It's not our DNA. We like to. We like to constantly challenge ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when it came to creating the new menu, every more or less, I think only ten drinks moved from the first to the second menu, and everything else changed. So literally overnight, all the bartenders had to become comfortable with about 50, 55 new drinks, and it was it was a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. And as far as approach and making cocktails, it's fairly straightforward, right? Do you use uh, any? <laughs> not really. Um, some of our, some of our drinks. Most of our drinks have about. They're in the sweet spot of about seven to ten ingredients, um, but what we've—it's very, very hard. Our our bar setup is very intricate as well. We have about 350 cheater bottles on top of our bar, um, and it takes an awful lot of training to get used to that. Um, but now we're trying to get better. It's what uh, I think we was talking to Joaquin Samoya 30. He was talking about creative batching. So it's when you've got three liquors or three liqueurs in the same cocktail or whatever. It's putting those three together, so you're effectively cutting the three three steps, two steps out of your drink making. So. We're trying to be a bit better about it, but our drinks are very, very intricate. Okay. Um, actually, that's interesting. While we move on to Alex, that's a good segue. How do you feel about batching? Do you batch anything? When Fantastic. You work? Fantastic. Yes. Yes. So you think that's because you know sometimes let's admit it. If you go into a bar and the bartender just pulls out one bottle, pours it, and shakes it, you think oh, it's a bit of a letdown. You know, you want to see that show, especially with these guys. I don't know if you've ever seen them bartend, but they got a little bit of technique. <laughs> yeah, so to, to answer the first question, uh, I think the, our approach is even though the cocktails might look very different, they're actually very similar. At Artesian, we believe that uh, serving a cocktail is like telling a story. And the most important thing is that uh, in life, generally, that you have a good story to tell. So we always try to articulate the experience from a point which is valid and which is interesting. Uh, we want to amaze and surprise our guests. We want to be creating holy shit moments. 
Oh, okay. And I think you do. Tell me, tell us about this. What's going on here? Uh, well, this is a cocktail from the old menu. It's called Forever Young. Uh, we are very lucky and very privileged to be working in a, in a building with uh, such a heritage. So, uh, you know, over the course of the years, we had a lot of famous guests. And one of them used to be Oscar Wilde. And there's a document in the old books that apparently during a dinner held at the Langham in the Grand Ballroom, he got an idea for the novel, and he written a picture of Dorian Gray. And we thought like, wow, this is such a strong story. We should do something about it. So what we have done, we have taken every single element of that novel, and we have translated it into a cocktail serve. So exactly like the main hero, you have to stare at yourself. It gets much better after five of them. <laughs> the, the, so the drink is actually concealed uh, behind a mirror. Uh, there's also a little opium incense, because both main hero of the novel and Oscar Wilde used to smoke opium. We don't do opium at the Langham anymore. This is opium yeah. incense. Are you sure? <laughs> I don't know. Those Brits are a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, and then the cocktail, all the ingredients, they are connected in one way uh, or another with being forever young, with eternal youth. Vodka, the water of life. Vermouth, the Hippocratic wine, the original medicines. Eucalyptus, citrus, touch of maraschino. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so yes, we do pre batch uh, to answer that. Uh, we sell in uh, three months something between 50 to 60,000 cocktails uh, with two stations. It's uh, impossible to deliver it in a timely fashion. We work for a global hotel company, so the standards are very strict. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't pre batch things entirely, some of them we do. Uh, but yeah, the logic would be very similar. Mm -hmm. We also use slushy machines, and we age cocktails in leather sacks. It makes my life easier. Slushy machines? There could be a slushy machine in your future, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, so what about now? OK, tell us about this cocktail. Because what's interesting, actually, in contrast with these two bars is that uh, the approach is very different. You use a lot of, what should I say? The it's very theatrical. Right, and as you see, this is your Don Julio cocktail here, right? So what is this? What happens with well, this? Well, this cocktail is called Aquí Estoy. It's a it's a cocktail inspired by uh, my first visit ever to Mexico. I was amazed uh, by that country from the very first moment I, you know, we touched down, and on the way from Mexico City to uh, El Puebla, La Puebla, whatever you call it. Puebla. Puebla, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, I had right? one of the most amazing meals in my life, and it was just on the side of the roads. And there was this old lady with the whole family, and she was cooking basically taquitos on an open fire. And uh, yeah, I was like, because Simone, my partner in crime, we, we love Mexico. We said, okay, let's let's capture this in a in a cocktail. So we have created uh, the skull, which looks like a cheap Mexican souvenir. It actually proved to be the most expensive souvenir ever because it was made in London. <laughs> Funny enough, nobody in London was able to make the sombreros, so we actually <laughs> China? To, uh, no, no, we actually made the sombreros are from Mexico, okay. and we burn uh, cassia bark and uh, dried rosebuds uh, underneath the, uh, the, the 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 little yeah. sombrero. Yeah. So the moment we put it in front of the guests, we remove the sombrero. You get the puffs uh, of the smoke. Exactly like when you are next to the taco stand, and then you enjoy this uh, refreshing, like a Mexican swizzle with falernum, mezcal, tequila, some fresh lime, and perilla leaves. Oh, beautiful. Um, how much are cocktails at the Langham, anyway? Uh, 16 pounds, 50 plus service charge. So, okay, right. So that's what, uh, 52 American dollars? Uh, no, no, no. The pound, you know why they call it the pound? It's like, doosh, doosh, doosh. It's terrible. The rate's yeah. um, incredible. It's slightly it's so cheaper high. than Moscow. No, well. <laughs> Who wants to go to Moscow? And drinks a dead rabbit? So including uh, including the tax, it's fifteen twenty-four. Yeah, and no service charge. No service charge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so just here's a couple of other kind of preparations that they do. This is this is the uh, this is called uh, above and beyond. Right. What's happening there? It looks like magic. It's very magical. Uh, you, have a, you have a drink which is basically a cross between Old Fashion and Manhattan. It consists of aged rum, a 30 years old Pedro Jimenez sherry, touch of uh, fernet, some banana and bitters. And then above the drink, we have this uh, little cloud uh, which is filled with the scent of a fresh forest. Uh, it's basically, we did it as a, as a charity project together with the Guatemalan ambassador. And inside we have this little, like a worry dolls. So as the guys, as the servers explain the drink or the bartenders, 
uh, you know, we, we pop that balloon, you get surrounded by the aroma, then you enjoy the cocktail. But also, you get to uh, take these little worry dolls uh, home with you. You put them under your pillow, you have a sweet dreams. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work as a hangover free cure. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'll just show a couple of others. This is from something from your new menu, which is also a Mexican. I should probably also say about that picture one very funny story, because when we've been thinking this how we're going to shoot it, uh, you know, w we, we were very creative, so we suspended uh, the bag on like a little ropes uh, in the air. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we, then, then, then we, you know, Photoshop it. And uh, a week after this uh, came out, I got like all the Michelin star chefs sending me emails, how did we do that, uh, <laughs> and, and everything. So it caused, uh, yeah, it caused a lot of curiosity and fun. Yeah. We cheated. <laughs> nice. I hope you charge them a consultant fee for the answers, by the way. So this is something from your new man. But actually, why don't you tell us what we're drinking right now? Speaking of slushy machines. Uh, we're drinking uh, artesian colada. Uh, basically, like, you know, few, I think five years ago, uh, nobody was pretty much using in Europe slushy machines. And people always used to perceive it as a kind of a bad thing to do. But my understanding of everything is that you should be curious about things. And I think that slushy machines, the good, really good ones, are a great tool. If you, if you can give me a exact control of temperature, control the dilution, uh, you know, if you, you can exactly control what you do, then it purely depends on what you put inside that. So basically, we make our pineapple puree, uh, we use fresh coconut water, two different rums, touch of lime, we cut out of the dairy, because I see that as a tendency that people tend to go lighter generally in both cooking and drinks, but also there's also a lot of uh, people with uh, intolerance to dairy products. So yeah, that's just our interpretation of Oncolada. Okay, cool. It's still light. All right, so, th and this, this is a new Mexi drink. Yeah, Mexico again, yeah. 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 So you know if you are in Mexico and uh, they prepare you the traditional chocolate on yeah. the table, uh, we have realized that it tastes even better if you put mezcal inside <laughs> and a <laughs> touch of Italian well, vermouth. Yeah. So, uh, so what we do, uh, what we have done, we have, uh, we have done a lot of research in a museum and we have recreated the traditional chocolate cups from the Mayan and Aztec cultures. And uh, we get the, uh, the, the waiters uh, and waitresses coming to the table. They swizzle the chocolate with the mezcal and with the vermouth and chipotle in front of you. We use uh, very good quality Mexican chocolate, like Okoa chocolate, mm -hmm. and uh, then they pour it over to golden nuggets, and they tell you the whole story about how Simon and myself, we've been in Mexico, we found the Mayan treasure, <laughs> and we stole a lot of the gold, and for the good-looking people like you, we know we give a little share of a golden nugget. Golden nuggets? The golden wow. nuggets are made of uh, chocolate as well, so they dissolve the moment you put the chocolate in, and that gives everybody important lesson in life. Mm -hmm. That's then you should never steal anything from anyone. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, that is Simone, by the way, on the right, just so we all know that. Um, so just a couple other interesting, fascinating preparations that you have here. This is called uh, selfie compatible. Uh, uh, we, reali we realize we cannot fight the modern culture, so uh, we prefer to make fun out of it. It's basically one of our best box service wear pieces uh, where we combine a vapor and the liquid at the same time. So the, the, the drink itself uh, basically consists of two different parts. In the bottom you have a vapor and in the top you have a drink. So you basically uh, smoke uh, Grand Marnier and chocolate evaporation and then on the top, uh, you have a cocktail consisting of like uh, craft pale ale from Bermonds in London, rum, floc de Gascogne, uh, some verju, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and touch of Campari. Right. And exactly like cigar and cognac or rum or whiskey, once these two combine in your mouth, that creates a very particular sensation. Okay, great. And this is a better... Uh, this is called The Magician. Yeah. Uh, it's inspired by one of my favorite DJs, uh, who plays a lot of eclectic music. Right. Uh, he's from Belgium, so I thought, you know, I'm going to make a drink. We, we found these beautiful cups from the Czech Republic, where I'm originally from. Uh, they've been made basically at the turn of the century in the spa town of Karlsbad. And on the promenade, when you walk from one, one mineral source uh, to another, you drink what the mineral waters, healing mineral waters from the cup. And they realized that if you had to drink from the top of the cup, as you walk, you don't really look elegant. So they came up with these cups, uh, which have a straw concealed in the handle. Uh, it's basically 
I'm fascinated with drinks which change as you go. So this drink basically changes the flavors. So you start like with cherry, then you go to the spiced cherry and jasmine, and then it turns into like a very light palate cleansing uh, smoke. It's basically a layered drink. And because uh, the straw, the way the cup is designed, it forces you to enjoy it in a very particular way that ensures that the experience actually works. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a modern Puss Cafe, if you like. And uh, we can't see in the, in the little handle, we also can't see like the flash paper. So we can, we start to tell a story. You have a, like a little hide, a lighter hidden in the hand, and you know, the fire goes on, and it's fun. So that's actual fire? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's does, fire. Does anyone's weed ever go up in flames? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, just curious. I mean, I'm concerned. It's real, it's real, trust me. Um, okay, oh, we just got a two quick more, so we'll just quickly go through these last two, because this, I actually had a drink out of this yesterday, and it's a pretty amazing piece of, well, piece of uh, equipment. Yeah, there's obviously we all love pineapples as a bartenders. There's a very funny story to, uh, to the pineapples. The pineapples, they've been very popular as a symbol of hospitality. And the brass pineapples, they came around 1800s, 1850s. There was a lot of famous chefs who used to serve like uh, various desserts out of them. There was apparently a famous French chef who used to do like a twist on uh, rambaba inside that pineapple. And then you would have like a grilled pineapple on the side. There was a lot of people who used to serve drinks in that. And uh, you know, like if you go to uh, Tiki Museum in Paris as well, you have all these pineapples there and we thought, fucking hell, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we've been really lucky, uh, was last, I think, July, uh, our designer introduced us to a gentleman whose great-grandfather used to make these pineapples at the turn of the century when they've been really fashionable. And as the various family members passed out, he inherited a house. And then inside the house, they found the original forms from the beginning of the century. So he was so kind that he allowed us to use them. We shipped them to India, because over there they are very good with this material at a good price. And basically, we made them there. The thing itself uh, has obviously a, a base of your choice, vodka or gin, whatever you want to put in there. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Tankeri 10, uh, Americano, uh, some uh, sandalwood cordial, fresh carrot juice, and it's topped up with uh, fermented tea with kombucha. All right, and so you can actually choose your base spirit for this one? Uh, no, said. but I sell it to various brands. Oh, uh, right. Well, that's <laughs> actually, that's what now I Now you know why you shouldn't of. be tweeting. I was, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say that the, the top part of the pineapples actually acts as a stand. So when you take it off, you can put the base of the pineapple on the, the fronds, which is a great. So who the hell's paying for all this stuff? <laughs> really, I mean, well, those I don't. are how much each? <laughs> how much are those each? Uh, one of these pineapples, if, you, if, you ju if just to produce them, is gonna set you for some 45 pounds. So it is, uh, it, it, it is very expensive. Yeah. The way how I work at Artesian is like, you know, in, in UK it's actually legal to charge people for listing fees. So people, people often contribute or they pay towards the co listing fee. So if there's a brand I want to be working with, uh, I don't know, whatever, you know, ta let's say Tankeri 10, and I have a pineapple concept, I say, hey guys, I know you <laughs> like pineapples. And in 1800s, you had it as a logo of the company. Would you be interested to spend X amount of money? I have to play really tough because uh, I'm shitting myself inside. It's a lot of, I'm asking for a lot of money. But I'm playing it like, you know what? I have another five brands who are willing to pay for these pineapples. Mm -hmm. And then they say yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you find so that you've had success with that. Most yeah. of the times you've approached the brands yeah. and they actually do. My know. opinion on this is that uh, the listing fees are a little bit of a bullshit. It might work in the supermarket, but I don't like to do that. I would hate myself if I just put it in other revenues because that wouldn't be fair. And it's not fair to the small companies and all that, and we need to have a balance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I ask the big brands for a lot of money, smaller brands for small money, or just a retro. You need to have a balance in your menu. Uh, now I completely lost what I was going to say. You just keep asking for money. Yeah. Okay, so take that with you. So just keep yeah. asking. So once I get the money, I, I prefer to invest them yeah. towards the cocktails, because then I'm giving something new to the guests, and the brand is really happy, because at the end of the day, they're just spending money on promoting their brands, yeah. because in effect, uh, it effectively does promote their brands. Right, and some of and your barware actually has the logos in them. We brand it in different ways. Yeah. Uh, the funny thing is that there's a lot of brands these days who actually don't want it branded. Mm. 
that's the most interesting trend which I recently seen, and we're having a big discussion why. Hmm. And Sean and Jack, how do you feel about that? Can you can you get money in New York State? Do brands just give you money for things? Switch off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they, they certainly just don't give you money. Um, yeah. But you can get money. Yeah. You just, you just got to know how to ask for it. Right. And I'm not going to tell you how that is, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, for example, we would have events and things like that. The way we would do what Alex does, instead of getting the glassware and stuff like that, we would have events. And as part of my brief to the sponsor that's having the event, I would say that part of what you need to do is pay for an illustration dead rabbit art type thing and it makes us look good it makes the brand look good and we do it in a different way where it's it's all image it's all like a an amazing looking event that we're having as opposed to a piece of service work it's the same thing just done differently um to me it's very very important to constantly put stuff out there in people's heads like constantly seeing new and new events and like we get these comments all the time on our facebook page whoever does your art is an amazing guy, blah, blah, blah. And it's all to do with brand. It's all to do with how we portray ourselves in front of the customer's eyes, mm -hmm. keeping the customers excited, keeping the customers interested. It's exactly the same thing, just done differently. All right, okay. Uh, we have got one more pi drink picture here, which is uh, right. incredible looking. Yeah, this thing is called uh, the Gdiva, another of the funny names. Because without all the garnishes, it looks quite modern. Uh, we call it the Digidiva. It's like a young people slang uh, in, in UK. Uh, so the Digidiva, how you recognize her, she's a very young girl, she's obsessed with technology with her iPad and her iPhone, or smartphone, any, any phone. Uh, she doesn't hesitate to unplug a DJ at the party if it means that she can charge her phone. And, <laughs> and if she has a sister, it's very easy to spot the sister, she would be referred to as an e-babe. And, and, and the way how you spot the sister is that she has less followers on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, oh. the, the cocktail, the inspiration for the drink, I've been always fascinated with the way how chefs play the dishes because uh, they work essentially in 3D, what we often cannot do with the liquid. So basically the task for this cocktail was to create something which would be in 3D, which would be visually equally stunning, but also which would allow you to change the drink as you go and change the flavors of the drink throughout your experience. So we came up with this kind of infusion vessel and we work with a group of foragers who two, three times a week just drop a lot of shit they collect everywhere around UK. And, uh, and we put the things through the vessels. So like, let's say like the, pub, the pine or the evergreens, they infuse into the liquid. The base is always the same. Uh, and then you have selection of little things, uh, which most of them uh, they, they are edible. So you have a little tiny uh, healthy uh, snack to that. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. That looks... Uh that's nice. So let's actually talk about the partnerships now. Let's get down to that. So, gentlemen, what do you two actually do? How do you break up the work? How do you break up the decision making, the planning, the, the creative business? Like what, how do you decide who's, you know, whose idea you're going to go with? How does that work? Um, I'll, I'll start this off. Jack's going to finish it. Um, so, Jack's a far, far, far better bartender than I am and than I've ever been in my life. So 100% any bar-related type thing that takes place in the second floor bar, the cocktail bar, it's all Jack's doing. Um, all the drinks, Jack supervises that. The way the floor is run, Jack supervises that. I look after everything else in the, well, not everything else. Um, sometimes a lot of that stuff takes both of us. But he basically leaves me aside to look after the top room, look after the third floor get the general uh, paperwork done, all that sort of stuff, all the, all the back of house stuff that he doesn't really, it's not that I'm saying he doesn't want to do it, but he's got other stuff that's probably more important that he has to do. Um, and on top of that, I would be more responsible for the image, like as I'm saying, the branding, um, the way things look um, to customers, trying to, like, in association with people like Ben, who's sitting at the back there, um, all our printed material, all our Facebook stuff, all our website, that sort of stuff. I'd be more responsible for that element of things. Um, and Jack's getting more involved in that because he wants to get more involved <coughs> in that. But the first year of his open was more to do with Jack really looked after the cocktail bar, looked after the drinks. Um, now we're getting somebody else in to take a lot of that responsibility off him. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be doing a lot more of the stuff that I do. Um, that's how I see the partnership. Mm -hmm. We don't interfere unless we really have to interfere. Mm -hmm. His area is his area and my area is my area. And that's how I think we work. Mm -hmm. Dan, you have other partners as well. 
Investor partners? Investors, or? yeah, other investors, yeah. Yeah, so investors, investors leave us to be, yeah. and to be honestly, we've, we've proven ourselves, and they would invest in us tomorrow morning to open another bar. There's no problem with that. The people that make the dead rabbit outside of me and Jack and the team that work there is people like Drinksology, um, the people that do all our like uh, illustrations and stuff like that. Hannah Lee and Michael, um, the people who do all our PR, they're probably the best in the business at what they do, and a lot of our success is definitely down to those people. And Ben Schaefer sitting there again, um, he, he's our right-hand man. He who is this person you keep referring to? This guy with the glasses. What does he do? <laughs> he's our, uh, he could give you a better answer than what he does, because I'm... I'm not gonna let him talk. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, anytime, any, anytime you ever see like dead, right, dead Rabbit anything on the website, uh, the, me like, the menus, t Ben is responsible for all the text. He's responsible for all the poster text. He's responsible for Facebook posts. I give him an idea of what I want said, but he's the guy that actually puts the words together. And it's very, very important. Um, and he does a lot of other things that uh, I would hate to say he's like a, a dog's body to me in many ways, but uh, I don't understand how he tolerates my shit all the time because I'm, I'm on him like a... I'm on him like he's my wife or something like that, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure Ooh, he hits me at times. Bad image. <laughs> 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 but how do you deal with that? What about you know compromise as far as the investors? How Im how do you please investors? Do you have to at all? Do they come to you with that? besides the obvious financial? Like, are they do they try to be involved in decision making at all? It's the people that we're involved with. Um, there's two different groups of investors. There's investors who've seen what we did in Belfast. They brought us from Belfast to New York. They are financial people. They do not have any experience in bars. They were investing in talent. New York, or sorry, New York was good to these people, and these people came from Belfast, and they thought, let's give a bit back to Belfast. They seen me and Jack as people who they thought deserved a chance, and they were prepared to bring us to New York and see, they basically said to us, if you're able to do what you did in Belfast, in New York, you will get so much more opportunity. And they really, really believed that we should be given a chance, and that's why we ended up in New York. But when we were in New York, we met people who own bars. And they're part of the investment team as well. And those people have been very, very supportive. But the reason why they don't want to free themselves too much is because we do a different style of thing than what they currently do. They own pubs, traditional style pubs. We've brought something that's really, really exciting to their doorstep. Um, something that makes the rest of their company look really, really good. Mm -hmm. And they're 100% supportive of us because of that. So um, we don't have to ask right. too hard to get anything from those guys. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's important to kind of negotiate uh, at the outset with your investors to make sure that you have creative control and they're just in the background? Like, do you find a lot of investors would want to have say? Like, when they come in for drinks, are they like, hmm, I don't know about this? Like, how do, how do you, how do you, how would you it was much more maneuver that? It was much more difficult when we started. Yeah. Um, but it's not difficult now because we're in control and um, investors understand that and they just let us do because they're, they're very, very uh, happy with what we did mm -hmm. um, and they know that if they interfere, I'm not, it's not, I don't mean this to sound threatening in any shape or form, but if they did interfere and upset the apple cart, that things might not be as they are tomorrow, mm -hmm. today, tomorrow, you know? So they let us be. Um, I'm talking about right now, maybe in a year's time, they'll, we'll get on their nerves and they'll say, get rid of you two guys or whatever. But uh, <laughs> at the minute they let us be and um, they're happy with us and we're happy with the fact that they let us be. No, they don't, they don't interfere at all. Mm -hmm. From when we first opened, we had cases where people were trying to come in and set their stall out. Um, we had one one of our uh, crew come in and turn the music off and put his music on. Um, so it, that was easy. There, there's moments in every business where you have to set your stall. Um, you have to tell everybody what you're about, and you're absolutely not going to compromise. So those moments did happen. It's not that they didn't happen; they definitely did, and they had. There was a, there was a few of those occasions, but we were always resolute, um, and we never never give in. Um, because if you if you give him once, you're, it's, you're, if you give him once, it's all it's all over type thing in our opinion. So, there w the moments did happen for sure. Mm -hmm. one, one so thing, one mm -hmm. thing, yeah. One thing I'd like to say that really really has helped me and Jack is that we both are together, 100 billion percent, and it's like he'll never make a decision. With we back each other up 100 percent. So if anything was to happen, it happens to both of us. If that makes sense. So two people together are much stronger than one person. That's my my experience. But how do you how does that come together? Do you always agree on everything? If we don't agree, we don't agree between ourselves. Right. We never don't agree in front of investors. Right. Mm -hmm. So as far as investors are concerned, we always agree. <laughs> 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 right, 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 right. Yeah. So it's like what he said, what you yeah. No, but I think that's important. I think you're in a very privileged position because not everyone can go into a situation and have that negotiating power. You know, but as you said, you had someone who brought you over who basically said, Come to America and I will invest in you. Yeah. So that's rarefied. 
Uh, what about you? You're in a different situation because you work in a hotel. Yes. Right, so what is that like? I work in a hotel, and all of you who ever work in a hotel or stayed in a hotel, you know, it's a world of its own. Uh, it's a, uh, its own little uh, universe. So for us, it's not only about understanding what is happening within our department, but also what is happening in other departments, in the hotel in overall, and then what is happening all around the world in all the other hotels. So it can be quite corporate, but I'm not going to bore you with that, because uh, we have a lot of fun at Artesian. The way how we are structured is slightly different, and I think it's easiest to describe it on uh, a structure of a restaurant. So in a restaurant, you're going to have an executive chef, and you're going to have a restaurant manager. Manager runs the front of house. The chef uh, would do the creation, the food, and all that. Obviously, then you have sommeliers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at Artesian, uh, I'm the head bartender. We have a bar manager, and we are here. Then underneath us, we have a assistant bar manager, and I have right hand who is uh, Simone. Uh, so two of us, we are the face of the bar. But as I said many times, there are so many people who work at Artesian behind the scenes who you never hear of, but they are there. So the bar manager and the head bartender is two different roles. And I think that many companies get this really wrong, you know? Because a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of bars, they put this workload on one person, and then w the only thing you're getting is that you're ending up with an average product. It's two different full-time jobs. They need to be done by two different people, and they need to kind of work together. So this is how we work. Uh, with uh, Simone, we obviously are in a very same situation Young like Jack. Uh, are you? Are you guys, Do you get along that well, the two of you together? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah of course. Yeah. Uh, like one of our basic how rules is that there's no I in Artesian. There's always us. Yeah, and no one should ever care about who takes the credit because this is when most of the problems usually start in any business. The moment who somebody starts to be concerned about who is taking the credit and the fame and who is starting to be the face, that's when the things go wrong. So that's why it's always the team. Mm -hmm. They're all working right now, and I'm sitting here talking, you see? But it's about the mutual understanding. Yeah. Uh, we uh, obviously, uh, I report uh, to the FNB director and uh, FNB uh, operations manager. Uh, further up the structure, obviously, you have the finance team. Uh, the PR marketing, communications, uh, the hotel uh, director, the hotel manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how but yeah. mm -hmm. over the course of the years, we have been very lucky. We have proven to ourselves, we've, been, we've proven ourselves. So from the creative perspective, we get pretty much 100% freedom as long as it is not abusive, racist, or uh, politically, or, you know, it needs to be. What about sex? Is that okay? Sex is yeah, fine. Okay, that's what <laughs> we like so sex. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask, <laughs> actually, about that creative freedom. So it's they give important that to, to have a good sex in yeah. order to create, guys. Uh, <laughs> taking notes? All right. So you have that creative freedom. So when you go to them and you say, do they, pay, do they give you extra money to, to put into the bar? Well, the are they... Obviously, working in a hotel, yeah. you work within a budget, so you would think like uh, CAPEX, mm -hmm. uh, which is a capital expenses budget. Uh, it's, it's a, you basically, you run the bar like you would run any other business, mm -hmm. you know. So there is money for equipment and things. Uh, obviously, for all the service where the hotel would be never able to pay for it. Only the last menu with all the ice ma new ice machines we got costed us 85,000 pounds. So obviously, we enjoy the position of uh, you know, enjoying the awards and the recognition we got, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that a lot of people want to, or they are willing to work with us and to support us, because they believe, first of all, in what we do, but also I'm very well aware of the fact that for a lot of the brands, it's a prestigious account, luxury account, whatever you classify it, and it creates image to them. They might not necessarily always see the money, because it has to be the hotel which sees all the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and yes, we do meet all the budgets. We are actually exceeding them. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's, am that's amazing. Um, so let's move on to uh, the guest experience, because I know having been to your bar a couple of times, it's, uh, it's an incredible. Has anyone been to the Artesian in London? Right, you're right. OK, so you know it's a beautiful bar, and the service is incredible, and these guys are just having fun, making great drinks, and 
getting your drinks on time and uh, just anticipating all of your needs. And having, as I said, worked at Dead Rabbit, I've actually never sat at Dead Rabbit and had a cocktail, but I knowing what these gents want from us to give to guests, it's, um, they are very concerned about that as well. So how do you feel about that, how, the guest experience? How do you impart that into your staff? What are you telling them to actually you know, make the guests feel comfortable? Like, how are you going about that? And why is that important to you, aside from the obvious? When we were doing our training, our training was very, very intensive uh, before we opened uh, for all the areas of, uh, of Dead Rabbit, but it's essentially what we're trying to, our, our, our guys to do is to feel that ownership when they're coming in, to think like a customer, um, see, see what's going on in the room. We're constantly challenging them for things like lights, uh, chewing gum on their tables, uh, like using your eyes to the, for the best possible extent, not, not just seeing something and thinking that it's not your job, um, like things like we hold really true are things like toilet, like the toilet. I've been to so many bars and they're a great cocktail bar and it's like a rock star bartender behind the bar and you go into the toilet and it's a fucking bomb site. You know, it's, it, that doesn't mean, that means regardless of how good your cocktail is, I'm all I'm gonna think about when I leave is how dirty the toilet was. That's all I'm gonna think about. And everything has to make sense. So the brand name kicks in as soon as you're coming in. Um, so your, your training, the look of the place, everything is connected and it's gotta be 100% accurate all the time. We're if anything ever breaks in Dead Rabbit, we're on top of it. Um, so the, when we first started uh, training for Dead Rabbit, your training is, is, is extremely important. Um, we provide the, the setting um, and make sure everything is 100% all the time. Um, that's, that's where we're, we're really coming from, if you want to. How often do you check, uh, <coughs> check the toilets? Uh, at the start of service and at the end of service. We were in a bar in Australia, and uh, it was... We walked in, we, the, uh, the aura was amazing. The bartenders were brilliant. They were, like, the, the concept was great. The place looked great. Um, the music was right. The sound quality was great. Um, everything, was gr everything was good. And then we, he said, go, let's go and see the toilets. We went <laughs> into the toilets, had a look. Everything looked, like, everything looked in order. And then we sat down. We were with two local brand ambassadors. And they were like, what, the, what are you two guys up to? And we were like, this bar's really good. And I was like, there's one more thing. <laughs> Chewing gum. And I want to say, it was like, uh, it was, but it must have been about a hundred chewing gums underneath it, uh, and we took we took her hand and we took it across, and she's like, "Oh, what's that? That's chewing gum." And she, was, <laughs> she almost wanted to cut her hand off, you know. But uh, that's that's how that's how serious we take everything in the bar. So, um, so he ma it makes it sound very very serious. But the whole concept from initially was that f having dual uh, a dual concept bar, a pub downstairs and a and a serious cocktail bar upstairs. What we were trying to achieve was. In our experience of cocktail bars in New York City, a lot of them were very intense, were very serious, and you had to be a p particular type of person to go to those type of bars. Um, so what we were trying to do was open our doors. The pub was on a, a ground floor bar. It was not in a basement. It was not up levels of stairs. And the whole idea was to try and encourage people who would not normally drink cocktails to go upstairs and drink cocktails and treat the dead rabbit like it was a house, like you were at a party and you were in the living room and you wanted to go upstairs to the next room and just have a wee wander around. The only difference is there's no dress code. You can be upstairs at 9 o'clock with babies and prams. We have absolutely no problems with any of that sort of stuff. The only thing is you can't be drunk upstairs and you have to sit. That's the only thing we ask. Um, you can't be drunk anyway, but I'm saying <laughs> that's the only things we have. Um, the difference between upstairs and downstairs. Downstairs, you can stand. You can make noise. Upstairs, you're a bit more civilized. You have to sit, but the same type of person. Not a different clientele. It's the same type of person. That's what we were trying to achieve, and that's what makes us, that's, that's what we're about with guest experience. Mm -hmm. When it comes to guest experience at Artesian, there's only really one thing to say. Uh, do you remember when they told you in the like a bar training that you should serve everybody the way you want to be served? Well, that's bullshit, right? We all know that. <laughs> because we all want to be served in a different ways, no? So maybe I like to be served in a particular way, but Cosa Luis, you know, has completely different preferences for the styles of the service, for the delivery. Maybe he's very serious, or maybe he likes jokes. So it's all about reading the guests and anticipating their needs. The most thing, the most important thing, is not to be meeting their expectations, but to ex be exceeding them. That's how you create the holy shit moments. That's how you make it work. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, so what, um, let's talk a little bit about the PR, because I know that you all are <laughs> PR machines. You're actually very advanced with that. 
uh, more than certain other bars that I've uh, come across. So how do you feel about that? Do you have PR that the Langham does? Do they pay for that for the bar in particular for you, or is it just, just for the hotel itself? Yes, obviously the hotel has an uh, internal communications and PR department. Uh, on the top of that, we employ an uh, external agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, we obviously work towards the PR ourselves. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. And um, how much of your personal pref your personal presence is related? You say your Facebook is that related to the bar? Is it all? Is it more about you? Is it always? Well, I think I that uh, over last maybe five ten years, we have seen a great uh, great change or swift in uh, in the marketing world, mm -hmm. and a lot of brands kind of freed up because they realized. Uh, that people or personalities, they can tell the brand stories much better uh, than, than the marketing campaigns. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it is uh, actually much more impactful to be, to be using personalities as a front of your business. And I think that both of our brands are, are just a proof of that. Right. And do you think at bars, because not every bar can afford a PR machine, let's be honest. Do you think that's absolutely necessary or can you? I don't think it is important to have a PR agency you're spending a lot of money on. The most important thing is to sit down and have a plan. So even if I don't have a budget, there is a lot of things which we can do to promote our place. And having a look at how this nowadays world works and you know having a decent understanding of internet there's actually a lot of ways how we can do this absolutely free from our smartphone mm -hmm. the one thing you must not forget is that the social media are only a tool so first of all you need to be doing things and then you need to be using the social media to showcase what you're doing it's not about only bragging on the internet. You need to be doing the stuff in the real life. The internet only helps you to present it. Keep doing things. Well, you do a lot of things. I mean, I've seen your Facebook page, and you are. You post, like, I don't know, once every half hour or something. But you're always doing things. That's that you're always traveling, right? Pop-ups here and there. So your Facebook presence is heavy. I, I love my job, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what, what about you, you guys? PR, how has PR helped you, or has it? Um, well, PR in our particular yeah. situation, so just give you a, a paint a picture of, of the dead rabbit. Um, we opened the bar three months after Hurricane Sandy. Um, the part of the area of New York where our bar is, is was wiped out. It was completely wiped out. All the office blocks around us didn't open for six months after we opened our bar. On top of that, uh, the particular block of buildings, it's 16 buildings. It's one of the oldest, I think it's the oldest block of buildings in, in uh, Manhattan. And uh, it's called the Francis Tower and Historical Block. Every single building that ever opened a business in that block failed. It was famous for failing. And um, so we were taking big, big chances. And um, we opened in an area of Manhattan that there was no other cocktail bars. There was no other even good restaurants. There was a few steakhouses. And then there was a bar that opened, um, Demi Mond. It was owned by, <laughs> opened by the same team of guys that run Death and Company very, very famous cocktail bar in New York. And it opened and closed in six months. And this all happened just as we were opening our bar. So there was an element of, are we doing the right thing here? Um, is this area ready for cocktails? Um, and this type of thing getting on our heads. Me and Jack had to sit and debate this every single day. We were thinking, are we making the right decision? Everybody thought we were complete lunatics to open the bar in that area. And um, I would honestly say that if we didn't have a PR machine on board, like Hannah Lee and Michael, if we didn't have them on board, we would have probably opened and closed in six months also. Um, those guys, um, before we opened, um, I believe we were one of the most anticipated bar openings in New York City history. Um, before we opened the bar, I believe we had more pre-opening publicity than any other bar in New York. And it's down to these guys and how they managed the RPR. Um, on top of that, I would like to say that, yes, we do have a very big Facebook uh, presence. Um, we manage that very, very well, very tactfully. Um, ben here is our, our Facebook guy. And I want to give an example of how me and Jack totally messed up um, PR before we had Hannah on board, before we had Ben on board. Um, these guys in Belfast that do all our imagery, they've done a, an amazing illustration. It's actually, this illustration is on my t-shirt, believe it or not. And uh, it has the image of an up upside down tied up rabbit and with, a, with a cross in its eye. And we had this as, a, a as part of our grocery bag. And the whole, the whole uh, idea behind it was 
Apparently the Dead Rabbits, the gang back in the day, when they went to fight the Bari boys and this and the other, they went to war with a rabbit in their hand. And when they threw the rabbit into the pit, that meant it was time to fight type of thing. That's the legend. So we got this illustration done with this rabbit and uh, we put it up on our Facebook page, our Dead Rabbit Facebook page, before we had somebody like Ben, an American, a New Yorker, who knew how to talk to people, because we didn't. We were from Belfast. We hadn't got a clue how to talk to Americans. And um, we put this image up of this tied up cartoon rabbit that was dead. And um, we were nearly closed before we opened the bar. Um, we had PETA, PETA attacked us like you cannot imagine. <laughs> um, they, we, so we, were called, we were called Jeffrey Damner. We were called uh, you, the only dead rabbit is a dead rabbit. Do you understand what I mean? I know people who know people who know people. We were getting these threats. You cannot believe. I, th I thought I was having a heart attack. And I actually sent myself into hospital. It ended up I had indigestion or something like that. But uh, <laughs> I, really, I really remember walking down the street and feeling dizzy because I believed we were going to be, they were going to be standing outside our door with red paint, throwing red paint around people. Anybody that approached that bar, I believed that we were going to be, they were going to be totally wiped out. It was just going to be an awful experience. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And that's where everything went wrong for us. And if we hadn't got people, professional people, in our instance, like people like Ben and Hannah and Michael, we, we'd have probably been closed. <laughs> I would like to give an example of uh, what Sean did particularly well in my eyes. And like, year before they've been opening, he was already writing a blog in a very prestigious European bar magazine, which, which is followed by a lot of industry. So we've been reading about how he's, what he's going through, how he's opening the bar, what he's planning for the bar. And I think it was genius to be talking about what you're going to be doing in the future, because everybody, that's exactly what was creating that hype before that. And it only proven how much the guys believe in it, in that, how much vision they had, how strongly they felt about it. And if you, strong, you know, if you feel very strongly about something, that's make sure that it's a success. Mm -hmm. And just right now, can you actually tell us what we're drinking? And I would love one, please. Can I have one of those lovely cocktails? What are, what are we drinking, darling? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is the above and beyond. Yeah, yeah. But tell us about it. Let's this actually go back. Yeah, to what this is a drink this uh, is this with a balloon without the balloon. Yeah, this is this is what we're drinking right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, so What's it? H Ram. <laughs> 30 or so Pedro Jimenez, uh, touch of fernet, touch of banana and bitters. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's move on to talk a little bit about branding now. Because that's uh, that's one of those words that everybody's throwing around. Everybody needs to have a brand, you've got to build your own brand. So how again, do we all need to do this for our bar? Does a bar need to be a brand? Do I need to be a brand working as a bartender in a bar? Um, how do you do it? And uh, I, I just want to give it, show an example of the things that for Dead Rabbit has done. I mean, they have this kind of style. Thank you, darling. You're too kind. Uh, this, this, uh, the one. same. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Are they bringing another one? Yeah, this, the same people design, right? Drinks all of they design all your posters. Mm -hmm. for, like, tell us about that. Tell us about how that works. So this is an example of what we do. Uh, Artesian, for example, would have the beautiful, beautiful glassware that gives the customer that thrill. We do things like this, as opposed to the, the, um, the glasses and stuff like that. It's the same idea, just done differently. So for every event that we do like this, one of these illustrations costs about $2,000. Um, we get people to pay for that type of thing as part of the event. Um, but the, the, um, we get, I think to date, we've been open, we've been open uh, 15 months. I think we've had 22 of these illustrations done in the last 15 months. And on top of that, we've probably had two or three videos, similar type of idea, cartoon style videos. Um, but it's the sort of thing we take, uh, we take this sort of thing very seriously. It's, uh, it keeps customers uh, interested. And um, our, f our fan base, like for example, we've only been open 15 months, but we've got coming up to 8,500 followers on Facebook. He and said fan base. <laughs> 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 no, it's great. No, that's, that's interesting. I mean, bartenders, rock stars. No, it's, it's I want to be honest, fan though. Base. Uh, yeah. Fan base is probably a right word because half of our Facebook, I would say half of our Facebook uh, followers are Irish. Mm -hmm. and Northern Irish particularly, where we're from, and it's the first port of call for anybody coming from Northern Ireland. When they come to New York, they come straight to the dead rabbit with their luggage, and it's just the way it is. They, they come straight. They want to meet the guys that have uh, done something positive for where they come from and where we've come from. So um, it's, yeah. Yeah. It is very important to have branding because that allows you to understand yourself but also to guide you. So every brand, every bar, Every person, every single of you bartenders should have kind of a brand deck. You don't necessarily need to have it on the paper, 
but you should have it in some shape or form. Things like materials you use, the colors, they are very important and they will help people to relate to your brand, but also to understand it and to spot it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to have your brand deck uh, because uh, it will guide you through what you are all about. And it doesn't matter whether it's illustration or color or the signature scent of your place, how the place will actually smell always, uh, but it's really important to have these things. And the more clear plan you have of how you're gonna do things, the better you can execute them. Mm -hmm. And it's also helpful when you're not sure about something. If you have this simple set of rules, this your little brand deck, uh, you always know how to do it. And it's even the language. Like you see that they have one particular person always designing the language no matter what the message is. That's very important. But how are you thinking when you're thinking about your brand? Are you, whenever you go out, whenever you're doing an event, are you always thinking as Alex Kretan, a head bartender of Artesian, or are you ever allowed to just be yourself anymore? You know, because it's always Well, I think as a bartender, you, to a certain extent, you become a public personality. Mm -hmm. uh, but So it's not about acting it, but it's about being consistent in the messages you send. But I think the most important uh, thing about every brand is that the brand needs to be smashable. Like if you break a bottle of Coca-Cola and leave it on the floor, everybody in the world will realize it's a bottle of Coca-Cola. So if you look at all the signature glassware we had there, uh, every time there was a wooden material involved, like in the mirror, in the Digidiva, in the selfie compatible, that wood is the same wood like our back bar, it's the same grain of wood, it's exactly the same color. And I if I didn't tell you, you would never recognize that, but I think it is important to think to this kind of extent of a detail. Okay, and I, thank you again. So yeah, I just wanted to show a couple of, uh, you know, um, this was the, what was this for again? The oh, the anniversary party, right. So whenever Dead Rabbit, well tell us, whenever you have an event and or launch or something, you always have these uh, invitations created, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> and um, so because our relationship with the guys that do this has gone back seven years now, it goes back to when we were in Belfast, when we were working in the Merchant Hotel, um, they run the Connoisseurs Club. I don't know if any of you are aware of the Connoisseurs Club, but it was a big thing back in the day when we were in Belfast. They actually ran that with us. Um, another thing that they did, for example, the Merchant Hotel back in the day was famous for the Mai Tai cocktail. We had a bottle of Ren Nephew 17-year-old rum. They were the people that got us that rum. That's how the relationship goes. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest. Um, when we were in the Merchant, we won a Teals of the Cocktail Award for Best Drink Selection. They did the menu, not us. They put the spirits selection together, and that's how that relationship is. Um, but now it's got to the point where I literally tell these guys a half a page brief, and they come back with this. And it's just, that's how the relationship is, because they know exactly what I'm trying to think, they know exactly what I'm trying to do. And they've challenged me the same way me and Jack would have challenges. Mm -hmm. um, they've challenged me in the past about, there's a particular picture we have of a, of a, one of, it's meant to be one of our singers, or sorry, one of our bar staff singing, uh, Anna Hotley, she's singing a song, and I, sh I sent them images of, uh, of the girl, what she looks like, and we're trying to get her in a red dress, and she's singing a song, it's a thing we did uh, with Pisco Porton every, um, every Sunday night, like a, a soul night in our bar, one of our, singer, our, one of our staff was singing, but I wanted a rabbit head. I wanted the girl to have a rabbit head. I didn't want her to have a pretty face. I wanted her to have a rabbit head. A I pretty want, rabbit face. That's I, want, what you wanted. I wanted her to have a rabbit head with yeah. the, the dead rabbit tattoo of this on her arm. I just I wanted her to have like stockings to look, make her look like a bit like a punk rocker because I wanted people to look at it and people to think and say, what the hell is that about? You know, I didn't I didn't want it to be normal. I wanted it to be something that makes you think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Dead Rabbit brand um, and the style is very recognizable. These are new T-shirts that you've just had mm -hmm. had done, right? Um, yeah, and for Artesian, it's like different because you guys are so uh, mutable, like changing all the time. So I feel, I mean, when I think of Artesian, I, I think of innovation and incredible service and just you know, being everywhere. So it's a slightly different. I think. It's like a Nike, you know, like what was the month uh, of last year when Nike didn't come up with uh, new shoes or T-shirt which made you run faster. Mm -hmm. it, I think every successful brand should be about reinvention, <laughs> but keeping, uh, yeah, that's, that's the theme. Yeah. Uh, it should be about reinvention, but also about having a constant and consistent message. Yeah, and I like this photo a lot because it shows the sense of humor. I mean, as much as Artesian is an incredible, you know, award-winning bar and a five-star hotel, they still know how to have fun. You know, which is it's a great thing. Um, so just we're getting a little 
coming towards the end, I want to talk about your goals. So, I mean, you've already accomplished, I mean, you guys have been open for uh, less than two years now, and the success has been incredible. Artesian, you've been involved with them for, what, eight years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really, when did, the, when did it really take off? When did you really start to grab that program by the cojones and just say, all right, no more fucking around, let's do this? Well, when Artesian opened, it was a very challenging situation or environment because uh, the, the hotel was going through a 150 million pound refurbishment. Uh, the Artesian was the first stage of the refurbishment and uh, the hotel remained uh, open for business. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been uh, refurbing it bit by bit uh, and it was very difficult to pass out the message that there was a new bar. Uh, Langham never had a famous cocktail bar, which was actually good because that's what really enables us to do whatever we want. And uh, it took a few years to build up. We've been very lucky about uh, the position where we are because we are in the middle of a few of the most iconic neighborhoods in London. So it's a good mix of people and uh, we've been working for a number of years to get consistent, to get on the speed, yeah. uh, to comply with all the hotel standards, five-star hotel standards, with all the leading hotels of the world standards. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. When it really, good, you know, like when it really took off, uh, that's probably not for me to answer because people look at it and they see it as when the awards started coming. There was a lot of important things which needed to be done. There were some people we needed to get rid of, and it took some time. Uh, but that's what it's all about. It's about being consistent and constantly striving for excellence. Because mm -hmm. there's no point of have one moment of fame, but it's important to run a business which have a longevity and long-term vision. Right, and to keep growing and moving in different directions. Right. Indeed. So here we've got a picture of Simone. He's been doing. Uh, these videos for Jamie Oliver's drinks tube. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but uh, he's great on camera, so you should look those up. Um, so, and what about you guys? What What are you going to do next? You, you're moving forward. Like how How do you top what you've done already, which is you know pretty pretty good, I'd say. I think, I think the next stage for for Jack and I, um, we're very very interested in developing Irish whiskey as far as we possibly can. Um, so one of the big next projects we're going to be doing is. Um, our third floor, we're going to relaunch it, and it's basically going to become like a the epicenter for pot still whiskey in the USA. And we're going to take the whole pot still whiskey category very, very seriously. The room itself is going to look like a whiskey distillery. We're going to have all kinds of training, all kinds of dinner pairings, and things like that. But it's all going to be Irish whiskey related. This is coming maybe next January. And on top of that, and it's it's not it's not because uh, it's out of necessity more than anything else. Me and Jacker, well, certainly me. I'm getting to a point in my life when Everything for me for years and years and years was to be the best in the world, be the best in the world, be the best in the world. It was all about uh, that type of thrill, that type of buzz, and it's getting to that point now when it's not everything. It's actually... Say that again? Being the best in the world is not everything. What I really want to do now is start making money for myself, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, it's uh, yeah. out, of ne out of necessity, because I'm realizing if I don't do something now and start making proper money now, that I'm not going to make money, and... Um, so me and Jack are probably going to open a bunch of more bars just to make more money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just to add, everything will have our heart on it. Um, everything that we do has that has that signature of uh, any any time I w anything that I do and we do together has to be has to be perfect um, or as close to it as possible. I wouldn't uh, sign up to anything if it's not got 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 our uh, got our heart on it. Um, we don't. We've been offered. We were offered a, a seven figure sum to open up a chain of bars when we just opened, and we we turned it, we turned it down. It's only now that the hunger is starting to come back for the next bar, um, because when we just opened, it took, the dead rabbit took an awful lot out of us. Um, it was a uh, like he left, he left. Sean left his wife. No, for not, a few. not, not dead rabbit. <laughs> 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 but, uh, to come over, we left everything behind. We put everything on the line to come over and give this, give it a shot, and it's 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 done really well for us. But everything that we do will be coherent with what we're doing. But we will be opening up more places for sure. Right. So. so basically, you're saying you need to have that singularity of vision, and to always feel like you're the best. Even you know, just to, so you can have that mental game, right? Every, so you every, can be every every time. Every time I can speak for both of us here. Every time we wake up, we want to be the best in the world. There's no, there's no two ways about it. I know Alex is exactly the same. Um, it's not. It's not me saying that we are the best in the world because it's the same. It goes back to this the guest experience. Everybody's interpretation of the best in the world is different. But everything that I do, I have to feel like I'm giving 100% to it, and I can walk away feeling proud of it. Um, 
because if I don't feel that, that's that's it's a fundamental flaw for mm. me for me, and I know Sean's the same. So, mm. I th yeah, go ahead. And the most important thing about it all is to be happy because if you are happy about what you do, that's when you can really excel at it, yeah. like these two guys. But if being the best makes you happy, then you win win. <laughs> I'm com yeah. I'm coming to questions in in three point five minutes. The well, final thing I like to say is um, having bars like. When you, when you set out to be the best in the world and having bars like Artesian in the world, it really, really, uh, without p people like Alex and what they're doing, it's like you really, really, we focus on what they do intently and um, they impress the life out of us. And uh, it's just great to have people out there that really think the same as you and want to be the same as you. It's just great to have that sort of challenge and I'm just really thankful to people that come around. Yeah. Uh, and I can attest to that intensity. It's uh... <laughs> So I w how do you... Okay, in, the, in closing, what do you say to people in this room, people who, around the world, who maybe don't have 85,000 pounds to spend on an ice machine or don't have these great investors with, you know, limitless resources, it seems. So how do you, how do you give everything? How do you strive to, how do you get to be the best? How do you, you know, well, stand I, out? I worked in a bar. I worked in pubs for six years. I didn't take bartending seriously at all. Mm -hmm. And then something happened in 19, 1998 that made me want to take part in it seriously. And I came from a really run-down area of North Belfast. And the chances of people like me and Jack, who came from the exact same area, doing what we did um, were a million to one. There's absolutely no way that it should have happened. It should not have happened. We should still be in Belfast. And we made it happen. And I believe if we can make it happen, that anybody in the world can make it happen. It really is all about you, yourself, mm -hmm. and how you how, have... Uh, how much you prepare to go and how much you prepare to give. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm from the Czech Republic originally. I grew up in, uh, in the second biggest, not town, but village in the Czech Republic, in a very poor neighborhood, uh, from a divorced family and all that. But it's not about it. It's about what you want in life and exactly what this guy said. The only mistake which I've been doing for years was that like every time I felt uncomfortable, every time people said something I didn't agree with, I didn't tell them. I was too scared, and for a number of years, I was just taking it because that's, I, I, that's what I grew up with, because I grew up during the communism where you fucking shut up. <laughs> every time somebody is doing something you don't like, everybody, you know, every time there's something you are not comfortable with, even with your company, even if it means that you're meant to be losing your job, in a very nice and polite way, tell them your point because that's how you make things happen. Mm -hmm. So every time I'm not comfortable with something, I tell it to the people, but in a nice way. Always be polite. And I think you can get very far away. And all of us together here, we are in the business of excellence. So if you aim always to do the things, your best 100%, they're still wrong, but tomorrow can be another 100%. Right. So keep pushing, keep striving. Relentless, right? Okay. So let's open it up. I just wanted to show Artesian pop-up, just another thing that these guys are always in different cities doing different things. Dead Rabbit did a pop-up here at Tails last year. And uh, just wanted to show this last, um, I don't know if you guys heard about the Artesian versus Dead Rabbit um, yeah, battle that, that happened at MCC earlier this year. So this was a poster that ha had done for that. So there's Simone in the background. So I have one thing to say. Yeah. The, the delayed... The, the stripper wasn't my sister, it was only a Shh. joke. I wasn't going to mention that. No. She was, she was she good. She was a student. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And she seemed to be on a tight budget. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's open up to questions. Anyone have anything they want to know from these gents? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, what the process was for you to... Um, bring your cocktail program and vision of your, I guess, brand and um, what you saw as it being as true to your vision. What were the resources that enabled you to do that? And what, was, what did the process look like? like I mean, when we, when we first started out um, with, with the idea, uh, Sean's concept was very strong and I had a very strong idea of what I wanted to achieve through our program. Um, we had come from the merchant, um, and I was a younger bartender. Um, I was working in the merchant from the years of 18 to 22, and I just finished up a stint of milk and honey in London, and I was kind of bored with all the pretentiousness of, bar of bartending. I wanted something that was completely, like, very relaxed, um, but yet serious at the same time. 
Um, and I think a lot of people say that about the Dead Rabbit when they go to it, but that was the idea. And I read uh, Dave Wondridge's book on punch, and there was one paragraph that he talked about the ceremony of drinking punch bowls and how like it was a secular communion. It was a bringing together. And that was something that I was very keen to achieve, and I really wanted to tell that story um, and tell it very accurately. So I, re I based an awful lot of it on, on Dave Wondridge's two books, Imbibe and Punch. And then his big bibliographies, I brought every single one of those books. And then I wanted to work on a strong English and French influence because I just didn't want it to be a one-dimensional American uh, story of, of the Kingdom of Mixed Drinks. So I, I was reading for practically a year and a half, um, and that was like <laughs> one of the early bones of contention between me and Sean because it was just reading at that point, and we had to send a menu out to uh, designers and stuff like that. So there was a lot of other factors that I wasn't thinking of at that time, but it was basically there was a moment that happened and it gave me the kick up the arse that I needed to start making the drinks, um, and then making the drink. The development period for that was a year. Um, I had I had everything mapped out in terms of the twelve categories that I wanted to replicate. Um, and then after that, it was just making sure, like every single, so you're telling a story, but you're also telling the story of each actual category. So things like the cocktail section in the first menu, you had uh, two morning cocktails, so you would have had a champagne cocktail, as uh, a seltzer cocktail. Um, you had your 250-50, so your, Mar your Manhattan variant, your martini variant, and then you had your old fashioned, which was called a whiskey cocktail back then, and then the new and improved style. So I basically wanted the story to be as complete as possible, and also to be authentic as possible, because in New York, you have these amazing bartenders living all over the place, the likes of Dave Wondridge could come in at any time, and if you're not right, they're going to tear you to pieces. So uh, everything had to be 100% right, and it was a very, very intense time, but I, like, I had a very strong idea of what we wanted to achieve collectively, um, and I, I think we, we achieved that. I just, I'd like to add that there was, in the first menu, there was t 12 categories, yeah? yeah? And me and Jack both knew that at least two of those categories weren't going to sell any drinks. The absence of the category and the diverse and invalid section, we knew that nobody was going to buy those drinks, um, but we had to have it for the historical accuracy element of the menu. We also knew that people were going to buy from the insert menu. But the, for us to get Tales of the Cocktail best menu, we knew we were going to have to do this right. <laughs> so that's why we put the absinthe category in the diverse, because it made sense. Yeah. I'm just curious to the Dead Rabbit crew, uh, if you have guys in, in Belfast, you've got your bar, everything's going really well, and then you have guys approach you, they want you to do a project in, you know, on the other side of the world, how, y how you go about choosing your investors for something like that, how you trust them enough, and how you move to another country, do you have an apartment while you're developing the concept, et cetera. Thank you. Congratulations, by the way, for everything you guys have achieved. I think it's fucking awesome. I think uh, a lot of the Dead Rabbits, uh, like when it came to trusting people, we had one investor that we trust implicitly, and his, his name's Col he's, he's a shy guy, but his name's Col Connor Allen. And he was a guy that basically found us in Belfast, and uh, he loved what we were doing, but we trusted him implicitly, like all the other investors that came on subsequently. We did, we did, like, and it's still the same now. We, we trust him to an extent, but Connor is a person we trust 100%. And I think it's, it was some, I remember talking to somebody about, about investors before, it's like getting married. Um, and you really gotta understand who you're getting into bed with. Um, we've, we have been extremely fortunate um, with, with our investment team. Um, I'm sure there's lots of, there is lots of examples of, of things not working out. But with Connor at the helm, and everybody that we, uh, we met, the Dead Rabbit was, was an ex extremely organic story. And everybody, like, there's not one investor that we have an issue an issue with, but it all comes from our trust with that one guy. So I think if you're, I think it's the same as anything. If we were to do something, there had to be one person that we trusted implicitly. So, do you want to add it? In other words, I think what Jack's saying is, if we were to open a bar in Belfast, Connor would need to be involved. <laughs> Anyone else questions? I have a question. <laughs> Do you ever experience any kind of backlash because it's always the best, this, you know, this the best bar, Jimmy and Call Dead Rabbit, a game changer in New York, you know, and, and Alex, you've been on top, right, world's best bar, 2012-13. Do you ever experience that or is, is this all kind of hugs and pats on the back? Well, every award you win, uh, you're essentially shooting yourself in the foot because <laughs> every person who's going to come out, come through your doors will expect so much more, uh, everything so much better, uh, yeah. People will explain flying cocktails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the, uh, it would be the same for Dead Rabbit as well. You have people coming in that, uh, uh, when you start to win awards, they also they all, almost kind of want to come in and get a bad experience so that they can go and talk about it. 
but again, it goes back to the brand. The brand's integrity is much more important than like we, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk bad about anybody or, or anyone. But we, if, if ever is a bad instance and we're notified of it, we will talk to that person mm -hmm. and try and, and try and make it better. Yeah. Um, so, yes, people do talk. Mm. And last, did you set out to you know open a cutting edge bar? I mean, I know you had the vision, but did you say, all right, I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to blow people away with my, you know, the cocktails and the glassware and all that. Was uh, that in your mind? Kind of, sort of? I think it was. No. <laughs> no. It wasn't at all. No. I want to be happy, healthy, and hopefully have I wealthy. I don't believe that. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Really? No, I think, uh, you know, this is going to sound like a cliche, but it's what is it all about. If you if you really find a job you love, uh, it, it fulfills you 100%. Mm -hmm. And I'm very lucky that I found a job I love. The day I found it, I have retired. I never worked since then, really. That's why you see me all around the place, because I actually never work. I've retired at the age of 16 years old, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> Yes, we, we wanted to be the best in the world. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, when we uh, we were doing Merchant and, and Dead Rabbit, it was a, it was a, it was always a vision. Don't get me wrong. We are very very happy with what we do, but we want we we really want to be the best. It's it's uh, when you when you play for a football team or you do anything in life, there's always a number one. Um, and if you're not number one, I'm not really too interested to be honest. Um, but that's just my personal thing. So the thing, the thing that gives me great satisfaction is just um, knowing that the normal customer that comes to our bar, not necessarily the bartender, bartenders come and they have these high expectations and stuff, but the normal customer, the person that has heard about the dead rabbit but maybe doesn't even really know what it is except you can get nice cocktails there, those people seem to be blown away by what we're doing and that's, that's very, very important to me. I follow their Twitter feeds, I follow their, the Facebook posts that these people put up and that's what makes me really happy is the normal person on the street really likes what we're doing. No matter how many awards you get, the only thing which matters is that for every single person, and I look after all, uh, more than 400 people a day, that every single of them thinks, wow, this was the best bar I've ever been to. Yeah? Because the award night, that's tonight, and that's only one day in a year. I'm open 365, seven days a week. We open at 11 in the morning, and the last thing we serve at 2 in the morning. So every single of you, if you ever come, you matter to me. And if I ever fail any of you, that's what makes me very sad. Because exactly like these guys, we want to make all of you very happy. I, th I think that's a great no <laughs> note to end on, Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of intensity up here, ladies and gents. A lot of testosterone, but intensity also. So I just wanted to, first of all, thank the panelists so much. I really appreciate this. Sean Muldoon. Thank you, Frankie. The super Jack Frankie. McGarry, Alex Cretena, Simone Caporali somewhere. And, um, Yes, and I'm Frankie Marshall, and I want to thank our sponsors, Bacardi. Um, it was very nice of them to you know, help us out here a little bit. And uh, thank you all for being here, and also thank you to the Caps for doing all this work and batching all the cocktails. So enjoy the rest of your tales. Thank you so much.